Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you are. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to this final panel for this conference. I understand it's been going really well, and I'm only sorry that I haven't been able to attend all of the extraordinary panels at this AALS conference on rebuilding democracy and the rule of law. Of course, this session is focused on improving presidential elections going forward. So looking ahead, I think this is a crucial bookmark to this conversation. Uh, it's my job really to ensure that our incredible panelists have the appropriate amount of time to share their remarks with you. So I will offer brief, very brief introductions of each of the five panelists. They will speak uh, for roughly seven minutes and have an opportunity to engage with each other. And we will then also be taking questions from the attendees. So our first panelist is Joshua Douglas, who is the Ashland Inc. Spares Distinguished Research Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky. He is the author of Vote for US, Vote for Us, stated otherwise, how to take back our elections and change the future of voting. He teaches and researches election law and voting rights, civil procedure, constitutional law, and judicial decision-making. Joshua's most recent legal scholarship focuses on the constitutional right to vote with an emphasis on state constitutions as well as the various laws, rules, and judicial decisions impacting election administration. He has also written extensively on election law procedure. Thereafter, we'll hear from Michael T. Morley. Professor Morley is a faculty member at Florida State University. He teaches and writes in the areas of election law, constitutional law, remedies, and the federal courts. Michael is best known for his work on election emergencies and post-election litigation, nationwide and other defendant-oriented injunctions and the jurisdiction of the federal courts and their equitable powers more generally. He has testified before congressional committees, made presentations to election officials for the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, and participated in bipartisan blue ribbon groups to develop election reforms. We will then hear from Derek T. Muller, who is a faculty member at the University of Iowa Law School. Derek's research focuses on election law, particularly the role of states in the administration of federal elections. He graduated from the University of Notre Dame and worked as a judicial clerk for the Honorable Raymond W. Grinder of the United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit in St. Louis, Missouri. He then practiced litigation with Kirkland and Ellis in Chicago. Professor Muller has taught at Penn Law, Penn State Law, Notre Dame Law School, and Pepperdine. He teaches election law, federal courts, civil procedure, admin law, and evidence. Next, we'll hear from Professor Richard Pildes, he is the Sudler Family Professor of Constitutional Law at NYU. Rick is one of the nation's leading scholars of constitutional law and a specialist in legal issues concerning democracy. A former law clerk to Justice Thurgood Marshall, he has been elected into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Law Institute. He has also received recognition as a Guggenheim Fellow and a Car Carnegie Scholar. In dozens of articles and his acclaimed casebook, The Law of Democracy, he has helped create an entirely new field of study in the law school. His work in this field systematically explores legal and policy issues concerning the structure of democratic elections and institutions, such as the role of money in politics, the design of election districts, the regulation of political parties, the structure of voting systems, the representation of minority interest in democratic institutions and similar institutions. Finally, last but not least, we'll hear from Dean Daniel Takaji, 
Dan is the Fred W. and V. Miller Dean and Professor of Law at the University of Wisconsin Law School. He serves in that capacity as the Chief Academic of the School with responsibility, of course, for faculty and staff development, personnel oversight, strategic planning, and institutional vision, fundraising, budget planning, all of that great stuff. Before joining the University of Wisconsin, Dan served as an associate dean for faculty and the Charles W. Ebersold and Florence Whitcomb Ebersold Professor of Constitutional Law at the Moritz College of Law. He taught a wide variety of courses, including Civ Pro, Civil Rights on Lawyering, it. Constitutional Law, Election Law, and Voting Rights Law. Still on it. Thank you all so much for joining us as the panelists for this very important bookend to this conference, I will turn it over now to Josh to kick us off. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Dean Nelson. And, uh, and it's great to see so many election law friends uh, and others who I don't yet know, but I'm sure will become election law friends. Um, so this panel is to, to, to put a cap on this wonderful two-day conference that I've learned so much from. Uh, and we're tasked with uh, discussing improving presidential elections. And of course, part of improving presidential elections is ensuring that people have access to the ballot, is to protect the right to vote. And we, in many instances, rely on the courts to do so. Um, and voters, as we all know, faced numerous challenges voting in the 2020 presidential election, uh, given the pandemic and given the current state of democratic discussion. Uh, and some legislator, legislatures responded uh, to ease voting rules, um, and but others refused. And when they refused, we saw secretaries of state, governors, election boards, and even state Supreme Courts take the charge to protect the constitutional right to vote. So when asked how should we improve presidential elections, I think we need to look at what is the US Supreme Court doing as an election nears with respect to the right to vote and how can we or should we not rely on Supreme Court jurisprudence. So I'm gonna talk uh, in, during my time about an essay I wrote called Undue Deference to the States in the 2020 Election Litigation that looks at the pre-election day litigation. We saw a flurry, uh, dozens and dozens of cases, actually hundreds if you include state courts as well. But I'm gonna focus on the US Supreme Court and the Federal Courts of Appeals to see what did they say about the right to vote and about how to uh, approach election litigation uh, in a presidential election year and what does that suggest for the future uh, and in my view this is not very good news now as a background the right to vote the supreme court has said is uh, located or recognized within the equal protection clause of the 14th amendment and the main test the court uses is referred to as the anderson burdick test named after two cases, Anderson and Burdick. Uh, and when a, a plaintiff, a voting rights litigant trying to effectuate the constitutional right to vote has uh, some burdens, shows that a law imposes some burdens, if they're not, as long as they're not severe burdens, uh, they still apply a test that is supposed to put the states to the task of justifying their laws. Uh, so if it's a non-severe burden, the state must show quote, that the precise interests put forward by the state as the justifications for the burden imposed by its rule, and the extent to which those interests make it necessary to burden the plaintiff's rights. So even when we're under this kind of a lower intermediate style scrutiny where uh, we're not applying the strict, uh, the strict scrutiny test, we still are supposed to apply, the courts are still supposed to apply a intermediate balancing test where we weigh the burdens that a law does impose against the state's interest for the law. But what we saw in the 2020 election litigation is that the US Supreme Court and the federal appeals courts barely applied those two prongs of the test and simply deferred to the states. 
and I refer to this as undue deference, that the states were given almost unfettered discretion to regulate the upcoming election as they wanted. And in many cases, voters were left without the ability to effectuate their rights. And we see this in particular in the number of the many cases uh, where district courts ruled in favor of plaintiffs, uh, said that the state's restrictive rules with respect to absentee balloting or witness signature requirements or drop boxes uh, made it harder for voters, particularly in a pandemic, to cast a ballot that would count. Uh, and on the balance side of this test, when your state is supposed to justify its precise interests for the law and why it's necessary to burden the plaintiff's rights or the voters' rights, uh, the district courts found that the states didn't have any valid justifications. But appellate courts and the US Supreme Court reversed those decisions. They credited the state's general non-specific justification of preventing election or promoting election integrity or preventing voter fraud, and essentially said that state legislatures have essentially plenary power to regulate elections. And so the protection of the right to vote turned into an undue deference standard, and one that places a thumb on the scale of state legislatures, especially as an election draws near. So instead of seeking the precise interests from the states and making them justify why the laws were necessary to burden voters' rights, the court simply deferred to the state legislatures. And so in this way, what we see from the 2020 pre-election day litigation is as if the federal courts almost silently overturned this Anderson verdict test and almost applied a rational basis style test in, in gutting these second and third prongs where the states are supposed to actually justify their rules. We saw this from Justice Gorsuch and Justice Kavanaugh in a case out of Wisconsin, uh, where the, the, these justices wrote that the Constitution says that state legislatures only should be able to regulate the voting rules and didn't seem to recognize the harms that voters would face during uh, a pandemic. And so it seems that Anderson Burdick is, is on life support, replaced by a standard that is simply deferential. Uh, I talked about the district court cases. There's at least 18 cases in 2020 where the district court ruled in favor of voting rights plaintiffs and invalidated a state law or practice often due to the, the difficulties that voters would face during the pandemic, only to see the circuit courts of appeal reverse those decisions or the US Supreme Court reverse those decisions based on deference. And so this is unfaithful to this Supreme Court precedent, but the court didn't actually explicitly overrule it. Um, as one dissenting justice in the, uh, excuse me, judge, dissenting judge in the Eighth Circuit uh, said, the state interest must be linked in some meaningful way to the particular rule or regulation that allegedly imposes a burden on a citizen's right to vote. But most judges, uh, appellate judges and the Supreme Court justices did not do so. And so what do you get is you combine this with another doctrine that I think Michael's gonna talk about the independent state legislature doctrine, which says that state legislatures basically and nobody else should be able to promulgate election rules combine the undue deference standard with that independent state legislature doctrine, and then combine it also with the so-called Purcell principle, this idea that you can't change election rules too close to the election. And the result is that state legislatures have almost unfettered plenary power to make election rules with very little to no oversight. And so what does this mean for the constitutional right to vote and for presidential elections? Well, the right to vote is underprotected. And also we're trusting state legislators who are really the last people we should trust to create election rules uh, to do so because they're self-interested, right? They can craft rules to decide who can vote and thereby uh, try to shape the electorate as they wish. So what we need to do is reimagine the constitutional right to vote so that courts don't give state legislatures so much deference in crafting the rules of the game. This could be through federal legislation, through be a, through, could be through a constitutional amendment, could be through the courts recognizing the problems that they have engendered by ignoring this, uh, the state interest prong of the Anderson verdict test. And I'll close by noting that I'm a big baseball fan. 
And, uh, and, and so I often think about how, you know, if, let's say the Yankees and the Red Sox, two big rivals, were playing each other, um, and yet the Yankees got to choose the umpires as well as the commissioner of baseball that got to set the rules for how the game is played. No one would think that would be fair. But this is essentially what we have through this uh, deference to the states, uh, and that impacts the way in which we regulate and the way in which we administer the presidential election. Thanks so much, Josh. I'm going to pass the virtual mic to Michael. Great. Thank you very much, Dean Nelson. And I appreciate AALS uh, for organizing this conference. It's a privilege to uh, be able to participate. I'm going to talk today about a topic that both uh, to which pr both Professor Katz and Professor Douglas had alluded in their presentations, which is the, in the independent state legislature doctrine. The doctrine arises from the wording of the Article I Elections Clause and the Article II Presidential Electors Clause. Whereas many provisions in the Constitution talk about the states and give the states particular power or the states particular responsibilities, these two provisions pierce the veil of statehood, so to speak, and instead single out the legislature. They say the legislature of each state shall determine the time, place, and manner of congressional elections, and Congress can make or alter those rules. The legislature of each state will determine the manner in which presidential electors are appointed. And so the question arises, what if any constitutional significance arises from the fact that rather than conferring this authority on the states as an entity, the Constitution instead singles out the legislature as having authority to, uh, over these issues? And one important point that becomes clear once you start looking into the, the case law and the history of this is that the independent state legislature doctrine can actually have a range of potential implications with uh, each of these different possible applications of the doctrine involves a somewhat different strains of case law. And so it's, it's entirely possible to accept some implications and reject others that it, to, to, uh, to invigorate a common law professor phrase, you can think of the, the doctrine as a they rather than, rather than an it. One other important detail about the doctrine is that while we saw it being vigorously pushed in many cases uh, by various plaintiffs, it's not something that was manufactured in the, in the course of this election. In fact, if you look through the 1800s, it was the independent state legislature doctrine was applied by state Supreme Courts. It was applied by the chambers of Congress in resolving election contests. It was discussed in treatises dealing with constitutional law and election law. It was even invoked by a justice story and Daniel Webster during the Massachusetts Constitutional Convention of 1820. So while the doctrine has fallen, largely fallen into desuetude in the 20th century, throughout the 19th century, it was a generally accepted uh, approach to interpreting these constitutional provisions. One other important aspect of the, of the doctrine is that it plays an important role in why we have the 19th Amendment today. There had been several states who had with state constitutions that prohibited the legislatures from doing anything to extend the, the right to vote to women. Uh, there, there were provisions in those state constitutions that were interpreted as purporting to bar those legislatures from ratifying a federal constitutional amendment to, that would expand that would expand the franchise to women. When the 19th Amendment was, was uh, passed by Congress, it was sent to the states for ratification. Several Several of these states, despite the prohibition in their state constitutions, nevertheless went on to ratify the 19th Amendment. And when the case went up to the U.S. Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court said that because the power to ratify constitutional amendments comes from the U.S. Constitution, it was conferred specifically on the legislature of the state, state constitutions were incapable of putting substantive constraints on the scope of that power. And so therefore, those state ratifications, despite the fact that they violated their state constitutions, were nevertheless deemed valid and the 19th Amendment was deemed to be a, a, a part of the U.S. Constitution. So I spoke before about the, the, the notion that this doctrine, the fact that the US Constitution singles out the legislature could have a range of possible implications. I wanna briefly in my time remaining, just walk through some of them. 
First, most basically, there's the notion that because the legislature is the only entity within the gov within a state that has authority under the federal constitution to regulate federal elections, that when other state actors take action with regard to a federal election, they simply need to be able to point to some sort of delegation of authority, some sort of authorization from the state legislature for the actions that they took. And so we see a handful of district court cases, many of them originating in in Ohio, where uh, state, the Secretary of State took particular actions, issued certain orders in connection with, with uh, an election. There was no statutory authorization for those particular actions. And the federal court found that not only was this invalid under state law, it also amounted to a violation of the, of the Constitution. Bush versus Palm Beach County Canvassing Board points to a second possible implication of the doctrine, the notion that because legislatures have authority to regulate federal elections, courts have to be careful to ensure that when they're interpreting, when they're applying, uh, when they're applying election laws as they relate to federal elections, that they're paying special attention to what the legislature enacted, which would basically mean a, fo a special focus on, on statutory text even if in the ordinary course of events, the courts would take a more atextual approach and would consider other sources, uh, perhaps state constitutional provisions, their own judicial, uh, substantive judicial doctrines in interpreting laws. And so a question arises as to whether the doctrine in any way constrains the ability of courts when interpreting uh, state laws governing federal elections. Of course, one of the main conflicts, and we saw this arise several times in the course of the 2020 election, though never in circumstances that threatened to actually impact the outcome, is the question of whether state laws regulating federal elections can be struck down under state constitutions. Right Under the, the doctrine, the argument would go that because the power to regulate federal elections comes from the US Constitution, state constitutions cannot impose substantive constraints on it. And so when legislatures act, they are subject to US constitutional constraints. They are subject to federal statutory constraints like the Voting Rights Act. They are subject to inherent limitations of provisions like the Elections Clause, but they're not subject to substantive restrictions in the state constitution. And that is perhaps one of the most important potential applications of the doctrine that the, that the Supreme Court needs to directly address. There is a, a, a line in the Arizona independent redistricting case from 2015 that suggested uh, the five justice majority in that case would have rejected it. But that this is something that particularly after the 2020 election, the court needs to address head on. I see my time has elapsed, so I'd, I'd be happy to talk about some other potential applications in the Q&A. Thanks so much, Michael. Uh, your comments, especially layered and intersecting with Joshua's are particularly uh, thought provoking. Um, with that, let me turn it over to Derek. Thanks, thanks so much, Mike. Thank you, uh, Dean Nelson, and thank you for all the participants here. It's been an enlightening conference so far. Again, many friends and familiar faces. It's great to be a part of this. Um, so I wanna focus on sort of a different aspect of the presidential election, thinking about Congress's role in counting electoral votes, which um, I spent a long time thinking about. Many of us on this panel a year ago were talking about this at a conference, uh, something that often flies under the radar, but certainly not on January 6th as there was the riot at the Capitol and the loss of life and all the, the events that flowed from that. But we can think about the act that Congress is going to have to do again in four years when it counts electoral votes. And that role is usually pretty ministerial in nature. But in the last several elections, Professor Brad Smith earlier sort of identified this too, you know, we've seen an escalation occurring in Congress in terms of Congress's interest and willingness to object to counting electoral votes. And the contemporary rule that we use, contemporary uh, from 1887, <laughs> is the Electoral Count Act, which sets the framework for how Congress is supposed to go about counting electoral votes. And in particular, the objection that was filed on January 6th um, was an objection that for that Arizona and Pennsylvania ha had not given their votes that were under all of the known circumstances regularly given. And this phrase regularly given consistently appears in objections filed or attempted to be filed by Democrats and Republicans in the last 20 years. Uh, sort of this rote language that comes out of the Electoral Count Act. And it's become kind of an omnibus, right? Uh, essentially, it's used for almost any kind of objection that somebody might have. 
I, I think the state didn't comply with the Voting Rights Act. I don't think the state's recount procedures were appropriate. I think the state's uh, judges usurped the legislative role in, in uh, creating election laws ahead of the election, whatever it might be. Uh, and so Congress has used this sort of simple language and yet put all of its sort of substantive concerns about how a state's electoral votes were compiled, tabulated, transmitted to Congress. So I have a, a paper coming out in the Georgia Law Review taking a look at this and really about this phrase regularly given. And the first thing I do is start looking at how that phrase, it's not a phrase we use very often today, how that phrase is a legal term of art was used in the late 19th century. And, and you can see this phrase used all over the place. Um, notice is regularly given. Taxes can be regularly given. A judgment is regularly given. Testimony is regularly given. And in each of these contexts, I think you can see it's, it just simply means some act or some exchange that arises pursuant to law. That's all it means, right? So when we think about that there's something done or pursued pursuant to law, and that's despite sort of substantive concerns that might underlie whatever that sort of formal exchange is. So a judgment can be regularly given in the late 19th century, even if the judgment is an error, right? If we think the judgment is substantively erroneous. Or notice, right? Notice can be given to somebody, please produce this document. And that notice is regularly given, even if the notice is deficient in the sense that I lack possession of the document and can't give it to you, right? I'm unable to comply with the terms of it. So we can separate those things that are the procedural exchange pursuant to law, separate and apart from those substantive underlying concerns we might have with the thing itself. So in the context of the Electoral Count Act, it totally makes sense to think about it in terms of the separation between Congress's role in assuring that whatever comes out of the states is appropriate pursuant to the rules that Congress has set or that the states have set, as opposed to anything leading up to the election and selection of those presidential electors, right? We can see when electors meet in state capitals around the country in late December, they formalize their votes, they write them down and submit them to Congress. And we can sort of trace everything in that process from the electors meeting in the Capitol, complying with the 12th Amendment, complying with other rules, to sort of transmitting them up to Congress to take a look at. But all that other stuff that happens before that moment is really not something that we should be examining because it gets to sort of the substance of the election of the electors themselves. It gets to some substantive questions behind that selection process that are not about this question about whether or not the votes have been regularly given because the votes are those things that the electors have done. So when we look at it in the, in the recent series of objections that have been filed in Congress, essentially all of them failed this test, right? In 2001, the attempted objections are that Florida failed to follow the Voting Rights Act, that Florida miscounted its votes, and that Al Gore was the real winner. Um, those are not objections about the regularly given about the electors who gathered in Tallahassee, cast votes, and sent them to Congress. In 2005, there were challenges to Ohio's electoral votes that they were not regularly given um, they were unlawfully appointed, whatever it might be, long lines at the polling places, uh, dubious voting machines. Again, all those kinds of things were inappropriate objections if we're only looking at the act of the electors gathering together and submitting their votes to Congress in terms of what is or isn't regularly given. 2017, there were myriad objections that were attempted to be raised. No senator joined them, so they were never formally considered by Congress. Um, but, but some of them, you consider the objection to Alabama was that uh, it, it was illegal activities by the government of Russia and widespread violations of the Voting Rights Act. Again, things that get to the sort of the substantive validity of the election, not the things that we think are sort of procedural questions that arise once the electors have met. The exact same thing arose in 2021, saying we have all these questions about the elections, whether or not it was a kitchen sink of fraud, of absentee voting, of whatever it might be. And the thought is, if we can look at this instead, that Congress has narrowed its discretion. It doesn't have the opportunity or tools to go dig in and figure out what happened. That's what the courts are for. That's what the sort of canvassing process is for and a recount process and an audit process. And all those things are left squarely to the states. 
When it comes to Congress's role in counting votes, however, this phrase regularly given in the statute constrains Congress and really ought to do so. And there's a lot, there's a lot more to talk about. I'll just tick off, I think, the five things that Congress can consider as I wind down here. The first is that if, if an elector has cast a vote for an ineligible candidate, someone who cannot be elected to that office, if the candidate has died, for instance, as it did in 1872, the second would be if the elector cast the vote at the wrong time or in the wrong place. This famously came out of Wisconsin in 1856, where a blizzard prevented the electors from meeting on the appropriate day. Congress ultimately counted the votes, but that would be the kind of objection we're talking about. Third, that, that the elector cast the vote in the wrong manner. In 1872, there's a challenge to Mississippi's election saying they didn't uh, specify that they voted by ballot, right? They counted the votes, but that would be the kind of objection. The fourth is that Congress, uh, that, that the electors didn't report their votes according to law, a list, sign, and so on. And finally, if, if the vote was the product of duress, bribery, corruption, or some other improper influence. And maybe these feel like anachronistic concerns, and maybe we can cure them in other ways, but I think it suggests there's a very limited circumscribed role for Congress when it comes to, to, to refusing to count electoral votes. Thank you. Thanks so much, Derek. Appreciate it. Uh, let me hand it over to Rick now. Um, thanks, Dean Nelson, particularly for uh, performing the thankless role of moderator. I always find it to be the toughest role on these panels. And thanks to the ALS and to um, Erwin Chemerinsky in particular for inviting me to participate. Um, I want to speak broadly at first to put my comments about the presidential election process in context. I consider that the most serious challenges American democracy faces today arise from the forces of polarization and extremism that are roiling our political era. Um, the dangers to democracy from the kind of extremism that unjustifiably denies the legitimacy of democratic elections are obvious. But hyper, hyper polarization of the political parties, as I've called it, also poses another kind of danger. Uh, because in our system of bicameralism, separated powers, it typically takes some degree of bipartisan support to enact major legislation. Um, as the congressional scholar Francis Lee has shown. President Biden, to be sure, managed to enact his first major piece of legislation through reconciliation with only Democratic support, but it remains to be seen how much of the rest of his agenda can be adopted if he fails to garner any bipartisan support. And more broadly, what are the greatest dangers Democratic governments across the West face today is their seeming inability to deliver effective government on the issues, economic and cultural, that voters care most about. That's why across democracies, we're seeing dramatic destabilization and reconfiguration of the coalitions that support the parties of the right and the left, the sudden upsurge of third, fourth, yet more parties, the much longer time it takes governments and PR countries to form governing coalitions and a lot of other manifestations of this disaffection from the traditional political parties and processes. Um, and if democratic governments can't deliver effective government on the issues voters care most about, um, it can lead to distrust, alienation, withdrawal from participation, or even worse, uh, the desire for more authoritarian leaders who promise to cut through all of this dysfunction. So for these reasons, I consider political reforms that can help mitigate extremism and polarization to be among the most urgent tasks of American political reform, thought, and advocacy. I wanted to try to flag three primary areas first and then focus primarily on the presidential nomination and election process. Um, so first, we need to change the structure of primary elections. I know Ned Foley spoke about this at an earlier panel. Um, given how low turnout is, primaries today often eliminate candidates who would actually have the broadest appeal to the larger general electorate. We're all aware of how much the fear of being primary shapes politics today. Um, leading incumbents in safe seats to move to the extremes to preempt this threat or leading moderate senators to retire because they know they can't survive their party's next primary. Um, so without going through all of the different uh, ways we can think about political reform of the primary election structure, you know, one thing I would mention is eliminating sore loser laws, which prevent candidates who lose a primary from competing in the general election. If Alaska had such a law. Uh, Lisa Murkowski wouldn't be in the Senate today, despite her wide support in the state. Um, there's been a lot of talk of moving to things like the top four primary structure combined with use of ranked choice voting in the general election. 
But reforming the structure of primaries has to be a major item on the agenda given uh, these larger risks, in my view. Um, second, as we enter a new round of redistricting with independent commissions drawing more districts than ever before, we should give more weight, in my view, in this process to creating competitive election districts, consistent with all the legal requirements to govern redistricting, such as the VRA, equal population, and the like. Competitive districts force candidates to the center, safe seats push them to the extremes. Um, I know some political scientists disagree with this view, uh, but I've explained elsewhere and, and recently um, why I think they're wrong uh, in a real clear politics essay I, I published recently. Currently only about 17% of seats are competitive in the house um, and redistricting that emphasizes competitive, competitiveness could certainly generate uh, considerably more than that. Um, and if you imagine just even doubling the number of competitive seats in the House, even if it's only a third of the House at that point, that would make, uh, in my view, an enormous uh, difference. Um, third, we should be careful about racing to nationalize small donor matching programs for campaign financing, uh, in my view. I understand and share the values of participation and equality uh, that motivate these proposals. Uh, but um, all the data we have indicates that the candidates who benefit, benefit most from small donors come from the ideological poles of the parties. Uh, we don't want to throw accelerants onto these fires, in my view, and we should consider other forms of public financing, which I support, including ones that would direct more funding to the political parties to distribute to the candidates uh, of their party as they uh, see fit in their effort to maximize their overall prospects um, in elections. Okay, with that said, to turn now finally to presidential elections, um, I also think as a fourth area of reform to mitigate extremism and polarization, particularly extremism, we need to reform the presidential nominations process. The most profound change we have made in the last 50 years to our political process was the shift in the 1970s from the party nominating conventions to the most populous system any major democracy uses for choosing its party nominees, the system of primary elections with a few caucuses that are familiar to us. Most Americans take that system that we have for granted. I think many people think this is simply the only way or the most natural way uh, a democratic system would choose its nominees for the highest office in the land. But for 170 years, the party figures from throughout the country, national, state, and local, along with voters, had significant say in who their parties nominated. It's because of this shift to primary elections that we end up with situations in which there are 21 people competing for the nominations. And with such crowded fields, celebrity status, name recognition matter enormously. In the prior system, potential candidates had a broke or a broad set of interests within the party, represented by these party elected officials from all levels of government. With today's primaries and crowded field, however, it's now possible for a faction of candidate to win primaries with 35% of the vote and capture the nomination. So one modest reform here would be for the parties to use ranked choice voting in their primaries. This is actually a way, I think, of recapturing some of the need to appeal to diverse interests within the party from the old convention system, but apply to an era in which voters completely control the choice. Um, and the political parties used RCV in 2020, the Democrats in six states, the Republicans in one. It would make it harder for factional candidates and extremists to be nominated since they'd have to reflect a broader consensus within the party to win under ranked choice voting. Um, there are more significant changes uh, to uh, the nominations process. We can talk about that they're unlikely in the current political culture, but just to give you some sense of how other major democracies do this, um, in many systems, the party figures in parliament winnow down the candidates to two or more, depending on the country, who then are presented to party members for a vote. Um, in other countries, the law requires the parties to pick their leaders at a national party conference, which might sound very broad-based, but typically means several hundred or a thousand party figures. Um, I understand that, that those kinds of changes would be certainly more difficult in our modern political culture, but I think um, changing the nominations process uh, and improving what we currently have is certainly something I suspect many Americans think would be a good thing to do. 
So political reform, in my view, should keep the concerns about polarization and extremism front and center along among all the different avenues of political reform we're talking about. Um, and as we debate ways of uh, improving the presidential election process with the democratic election process more generally, I think these focal points, polarization and extremism really have to remain absolutely at the center of our thought. Thanks. Thanks very much, Rick. I appreciate your comments. In particular, um, thank you for illuminating the context within which deliberations about improving presidential elections takes place. I think it's important to uh, understand and appreciate where we are at this moment. And I wanna remind everybody in terms of our panelists, after uh, Dan speaks, I'm gonna open it up for you to engage with each other as the experts that you are. And then I'll look to the chat for questions that are coming from the attendees. So with that, Dan, last but not least, nice to see you, turning it over to you. Wonderful to see you, Dean Nelson. Thank you so much for moderating this panel. Um, I am delighted and honored to be with such a distinguished group, uh, including not only my co-panelists here, but the others who presented as a part of this great conference. I wanna pick up where Rick and you, Camille, just left off by highlighting the backdrop against which presidential elections are taking place. That is this background of hyperpolarization and extremism, most notably evident, I think, on the right, but also evident on the left to some extent, which, which makes our democracy, in my view, much more vulnerable than it has been at any point in our lifetimes. Uh, January 6th and the events of that day are just the most visible example of that. And to be sure, the problems in our democracy run much deeper than presidential elections and the way that electoral votes are counted, for example. But if I had to pick the point in our process where if we are going to see a breakdown uh, in our system that could lead to something much more closely approaching authoritarianism, it would be at that point. Uh, it would be at the point of a contested presidential election. Witness the fact that the election we've just gone through was not all that close. I mean, certainly compared to recent elections in 2000 and 2004, by way of example. And yet there was a substantial portion of the population that refused to accept and to this day still refuses to accept the legitimacy of that result. So with that as a backdrop, I wanna focus on a particular problem having to do with the timing of presidential elections uh, and make uh, three points in this regard. The first has to do with the so-called safe harbor date and the date for electors meeting in the states to vote that is set by the Electoral Count Act that a couple of the panelists have already referred to. Um, in a piece that I wrote way back in 2008, I urged that the dates uh, for the safe harbor and, and the counting of electoral votes be moved back, uh, that they, they, they both be moved back by about two weeks. Uh, for the past election, the safe harbor date, and that is the date by which states have to complete their post-election processes, including litigation, in order to be sure that the certificates will be recognized in accordance with that vote when Congress meets to count the electoral votes. The safe harbor date in this past election was December 8th. The date that electors met in the states was December 14th. Uh, the problem here is that that first date is five weeks and the second date roughly six weeks after the election. There is no guarantee that post-election litigation will be wrapped up by then. And again, this past election wasn't all that close, and yet we still had cases going on right up until and in some cases after that date. Imagine what things would be like in a close election. Um, the second point I want to make is that, although I still think it's probably a good idea to move back those dates, uh, 
I have been given some pause by the events in this most recent election. Uh, as you all may recall, we had a delayed transition, right? Uh, that uh, the, the then current administration uh, did not recognize the result and thus delayed the funding of the transition to the Biden administration. Um, and um, you know the risk, if you were to move back those dates, is that the transition is therefore going to be delayed. And so I do recognize that the costs of moving back the safe harbor date and the date for electors meeting in the states to make room for post-election litigation are greater than I thought back in 2008. Uh, I, I still on balance think it's probably worth doing, but, but I have to say these events have given me some pause. Altogether, however, I think it's probably better to have more time uh, to resolve post-election disputes, even if it means that the transition to the new president may be delayed a couple of weeks or the beginning of the transition process. The third and final point I wanna make concerns the interaction between this relatively short period for resolving post-election disputes in presidential elections and a doctrine that the Supreme Court has um, developed over the past 15 years, often called the Purcell Doctrine. It arose from a case out of Arizona, Purcell versus Gonzalez. Um, this was a challenge to an Arizona voter ID law in which the Ninth Circuit had issued an injunction that the Supreme Court reversed, um, noting in its very brief order that Injunctions by federal courts issued very close to an election can be disruptive. This point by itself strikes me as altogether unremarkable. I'm not, I don't necessarily agree with what the court did in that case. I don't think, however, that it, that decision, that order taken by itself is really all that terrible. What's happened in the intervening years, however, is that this presumption against federal court injunctions issued close to an election has hardened into something close to an absolute rule. We saw the most striking evidence of this development and to me, disturbing evidence in a quartet of cases decided in 2014 out of Ohio, North Carolina, uh, Texas and Wisconsin. And we've seen this development also in the 2020 election where when, and uh, Josh alluded I think to it earlier, when federal courts issue injunctions, um, often challenging a, a problem that has very recently come to light, often federal appellate courts or the Supreme Court will reverse them citing this case per se. Um, why is this so problematic in presidential elections? Well, the reason it's problematic in presidential elections and generally is because it makes it much more difficult to bring a pre-election challenge to a new election law or a new election problem, right? At least to bring that challenge in a federal court, which is often where plaintiffs want to be, especially when they're raising claims under federal law, such as the Voting Rights Act or the Equal Protection Clause. Uh, it makes it very difficult for you to get relief in, from a federal court for a problem that is newly emergent before the election. And before every election, there are inevitably a bunch of new problems that emerge. For example, last minute orders from secretaries of state and the like. Um, the consequence of Purcell, because it's made it more difficult to get an injunction before the election, is to channel those disputes towards post-election litigation. And that is a really, really bad thing, uh, especially when you consider the short timeline, because what we could see is that in a genuinely closely contested election, like the one we have back, had back in 2000, there simply isn't enough time to resolve all of the issues and, and work them through the appellate process in an adequate way. Uh, and what we might wind up seeing is the state legislature or a state's governor or Congress getting into an act and taking matters into their own hands. So what could be done about this? Well, I do think that this is something, and I'll conclude with this point, that Congress could address 
right? That this presumption is not um, something that is constitutionally required, that is the strong now presumption against federal courts issuing injunctions close to an election. It is something Congress could reverse. Congress has the power to regulate federal judicial procedure in general. Uh, and I think that Congress can and should do so. Um, it might be that the Supreme Court would invent some constitutional doctrine to make that more difficult or impossible, but I think that would be a very salutary change, which would not only reduce the severity of this problem for presidential elections, but for all elections. Thank you very much, Dan. I appreciate your comments. Um, I want to allow for some time for the each of for each of you to ask questions or engage with each other before I look to the uh, chat with questions from our attendees or uh, pose some questions that I have percolating myself. Any comments, insights, questions for each other, panelists? So, I'll, I'll bite. Okay, and then I see Rick was also. Uh, yeah. You're just muted, Rick. So. Uh, okay, well, well, I'll bite because I, I think the, the perhaps the biggest point of disagreement was probably between me and Michael with respect to the independent state legislature doctrine uh, and its efficacy or or lack thereof. Um, you know, I, I'm very concerned by both the use of this doctrine and what I identified as the undue deference standard, where we just defer to what state legislatures uh, say. You know, so they're both not constrained by state constitutions. Uh, and they're not constrained by essentially the U.S. Constitution as interpreted by the U.S. Supreme Court, um, which lets state legislatures have unfettered authority. And, and again, I think this is concerning because it leads to the potential of entrenchment. Uh, and, and, you know, you might say that, well, judges are, are no better at uh, regulating election rules and, and being less than partisan, but at least the judges are not uh, necessarily crafting the rules under the very rules under which they're going to run for re-election. Um, and so I thought I'd highlight, I don't know if Michael plans to respond, but I want to highlight that there's a little bit of a disagreement here in terms of that doctrine, because I find it a lot more concerning than I think he does. Yeah, and I'm going to ask Bo um, LSAC events. Um, and again, thank you LSAC also for uh, your, your uh, sponsorship and support of this event. It's tremendous. Um, Michael, do you want to uh, respond? And if hopefully you can be unmuted. And then I'll turn it to Rick. Sure, great. So really the main, the main point of my talk number one was simply as a descriptive matter to explain the various potential applications of the doctrine and the fact that it is it has become an issue that the court need, needs to address. So I don't know that I was that I was necessarily taking a, a normative view of the doctrine or, go or going so far as to defend it, rather pointing out that certainly it has a historical basis, it has a textual and a, and, and a structural basis. I certainly take your point that there, there are also reasons for concern about it. The, the, the one thing I'll say is because it is limited only to federal elections, right? It arises from the US Constitution about the regulation of congressional and presidential elections. You don't necessarily have that concern about self-dealing because state the doctrine doesn't empower state legislatures to set the rules for their own elections, right? It empowers state legislatures subject to federal law, subject to the US Constitution constraints to, uh, it gives them some degree of authority right, just over federal elections. And I'll point out, right, the elections clause does the same thing with Congress, right? I mean, the Constitution expressly uh, expressly authorizes self-dealing in that sense by saying Congress not only gets to set the rules for congressional elections, but gets to determine the outcomes of congressional elections. So to a certain extent, that type of political theory, viewing elections as primarily within the control of political branches, is somewhat baked into the Constitution. Thank you, Michael. And thank you for that um, insight as well, Joshua, and for your response, Michael. Rick, do you want to jump in? Yes. Yeah, so I guess I'll direct this to Derek, um, although anybody else who wants to um, uh, chip in on this would be great. Um, so, you know, Derek uh, talked about the Electoral Count Act, um, and this is obviously a key statute for regulating the uh, presidential election process. Um, and I'm on a, with a, you know, been working with a group that's, that's trying to put together a draft of a proposed redraft of that statute for Congress. Uh, and one of the questions, Derek, um, is um, this difficult choice about whether 
a, a, a reform statute should empower one specific official in the state, maybe the governor, uh, to have the authority to certify the electors after the state has made its final determination through its ordinary processes, um, in which case we would almost never be in a situation of two potential slates of electors going to Congress. Um, or um, should a reform statute still contemplate the possibility of multiple slates going to Congress? And the policy choice here, the reason it's hard is that um, if you allow more than one slate potentially to go to Congress and you're throwing the process into a, you know, the highly partisan context of Congress, if Congress specifies only one state actor has the legal authority to certify, then you're putting a lot of power you know, at the state level in, in that official, although I suppose state or federal courts could overturn a certification if it was illegal. But anyway, I'm curious, Derek, this goes somewhat to the question of regularly given that you were focused on um, and, and how reform of the statute ought to think about that tough choice. No, I agree. It's a it's a great question. Um, you know, in 1887, the thought was let's lodge that authority in the executive. That sort of and really the tiebreaker. Congress could always, if both houses of Congress agreed, ignore that decision that was made by the governor and go in a different direction. Um, and there's a piece of me that looks at the history. Um, we've had one situation where multiple slates of electors have been submitted. That was Hawaii in 1960. And the, the governor signed off on the Republican slate. And then later after court order, the governor signs off on the Democratic slate. So there is a sense in which governors have behaved really well. <laughs> and the, I guess the fear is, well, if you give them more of this sort of final authority and you really sort of ratchet it up and say, Congress is no longer going to consider multiple slates, whatever the governor says goes, does that put new pressure on the governors? Governors had extraordinary pressure. I, I think uh, in Georgia and Arizona in particular, there was extraordinary political pressure among Republicans to pressure those governors to do something creative or different. And they, they didn't bow to that pressure, despite the fact what lots of legislators were doing. Um, so, so there's a piece of me that thinks for a long time, we, we've trusted the executive. I think there are opportunities for courts to review that. If, you, if the governor is acting, acting ultra virus, if they're signing off on a slate that was not certified by the as the statewide majority winner on the, the existing canvassing processes, right? I feel like there's some opportunities to think about, uh, you know, the, the governor not just making it up, right? The governor is really sort of just ratifying what the rest of the process has done. And so for that reason, I trust it more, but I totally understand the concerns on the flip side and, and recognize the danger inherent in any of these systems. Thank you, Rick, and thank you, Derek. Um, Mike, you have a question, and then I'm gonna, and Dan, I think you're signaling you have a, a question as well. So I'll go Mike, Dan, and any responses, then there's a question in the chat that I'm asked, gonna ask you to please look at in the meantime. Mike. Great. Thank you very much. I had a question for, for Professor Muller. I'm really looking forward to reading your piece on this. It sounds like a really Im important and interesting uh, piece of especially the historical research. My question was, is the, is the ultimate conclusion that these types of objections are the, of, of the sort that you had identified are just categorically inappropriate, or instead is the concern that they were presented in the wrong form, that they said that we're objecting that these were votes were not regularly given, but what they should have been saying was we're objecting that these electors were not lawfully certified, right? Which is the other main buzzword uh, in, in 3 USC 15, the statute that you're talking about there. So I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that lawful certification requirement. Yeah, it's a great point. I think one of the important things that helps, and I get at this in a separate part of the piece, is to think about lawful certification and uh, regularly given as doing two different things and help us to think about um, you know, what, what we sometimes refer to in our trade as the denominator problem, right? And so if Congress wants to challenge the certification of the vote total, that these electors never should have been seated in the first place because of some problem, that's great and all if it wants to sort of pick that bucket and, and then maybe there's some other things that the statute has some difficulty thinking about whether or not there's an opportunity to file those kinds of objections and whatnot but let's set that aside for a moment. If Congress wants to do that it needs to be honest about what it's doing and not hide uh, those concerns that it has concerns about the underlying election inside of the objection that these just votes weren't regularly given and, and the point being if you challenge the votes as not regularly given, 
Um, the notion is then the, that the electors were still appointed. You have to get 270 electoral votes to get to a majority. And really, it's, uh, it, it doesn't change as quickly as throwing out the slate of electors in the first place. If you throw out the whole slate of electors, it becomes twice as easy to overcome the election, roughly speaking, as a matter of mathematics. <laughs> and so by, by sort of shoehorning those appointment questions into the vote casting bucket, Congress is actually kind of empowering itself to make it easier to throw out an election uh, than if they were more honest in the first place. So I don't get into sort of the, the, the true merits of, your, of the heart of your question, <laughs> which is, you know, should Congress be doing that in the first place? My sense is probably not, but if they're gonna do it, they need to put it in a separate category and be clear and explicit about what they're doing so that we can recognize the true consequences of that and get at the real heart of the concerns there. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Derek. Dan. Thanks, Camille. Just a couple of quick points. The first is that I really wanna emphasize the importance of the project that Rick and others are engaged in of taking a close look at the Electoral Count Act including the timetable issue that I mentioned, but there are lots of other problems with that law and it would be great to have uh, some resolution and, and rewriting of it uh, well in advance of the next election. M my favorite quote on this is one by my former colleague, Ned Foley at Ohio State, who's on with us uh, in a Washington Post uh, op-ed from uh, December. He wrote, I have spent much of my academic career trying to parse its meaning that is the meaning of the Electoral Count Act, and I still find it impenetrable or at the very least indeterminate. And I, I think that's being very generous, and I'm even more confused in many places when I read this uh, impenetrable act. The second point I want to make goes back to the exchange that uh, Michael and Josh had on the independent state legislature doctrine. I have to say, I'm, I'm with Josh on this one. I, I do worry that readers or listeners um, who are, who are not in, intimately immersed in the details of uh, federal election law may not completely have followed this conversation. Uh, so just in a nutshell, Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution says that each state shall appoint in such manner, manner as the legislature thereof may direct electors, uh, giving the power, it says, to the legislature. Um, Article 1, Section 4 says the time, place, and manner of holding congressional uh, elections shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. Uh, it's important to note that several years ago, the Supreme Court weighed in on the meaning of at least the latter provision, saying that the legislature really means the legislative power, and on that basis upheld a provision of state law that had been adopted not by the state legislature per se, but through its lawmaking process, specifically through its uh, initiative of process to adopt a reform that uh, uh, that embraced independent uh, an independent redistricting commission in that state. Now, the problem, I get the formalist argument for saying the legislature means legislature. The functional problem is that it would create a catastrophic mess in our federal elections because our state election laws are a combination of um, laws made by the state legislature, rules promulgated by the executive branch, such as the secretary of state, and state courts decisional law, which interprets not only these, but also state constitutions, which were not adopted by the state legislature. And that is the really big problem. I get the point that Michael makes about delegation. I think that is indeed solvable. But if you were to take state constitutional law out of the rules governing federal elections, you have created a huge mess where all states elections are now gonna be governed by two sets of rules. One of which involves all three sets of those laws, that is the rules governing state elections, but the other of which has state constitutional law and state judicial decisions interpreting them taken out. And that would be catastrophic, which I think is a big part of the reason why the court several years ago gave the legislature a functional rather than a formalistic interpretation. Thank you, Dan. And I know, Michael, you'd like to respond. 
Just a, just a few quick points in, in response to that. I mean, whether or not there's separate regimes governing federal elections versus state and local elections would be up to the legislature, right? Most federal laws other than the Voting Rights Act that govern elections only apply to federal elections. And so, right, the uh, HAVA, the NVRA, state legislatures, you know, choose to follow them for policy reasons, right, prudential reasons for state and local elections as well. And in terms of just the, the practical aspect, right, I mean, there are certainly many ways the Supreme Court could deal with that. It could say it's not going to apply it retroactively. It could say that right, state constitutional provisions would be that have all, already in existence would be presumptively applicable unless the legislature, you know, wanted to override them. And most provisions of state constitutions governing elections are reiterated in state statutes anyway, right? Certainly that's the, that's the, that's the case in Florida. So as a as a prudential matter, I don't actually know that again, depending on how broadly or narrowly the court embraced it, that it would necessarily lead to, to that sort of chaos. Thank you. And uh, thanks, Dan, for your question. And thanks, Mike, for your response. Uh, in the remaining time, I do want to get to some of the questions. There is a question from Ned Foley in the chat. And uh, as strange as it may sound, 2024 will be upon us sooner than we think. So uh, hopefully you've had a chance to look at Ned's question. I open it up to any of you who want to chime in about the likelihood of a, a three-way split in 2024 and uh, his questions about the Electoral College winner. I guess I'll just jump in briefly on, uh, in terms of third parties. I I know there's always a risk like thinking about a true split of what a third party candidate is going to look like. And yet like serious third party candidates are like lightning in a bottle. It's it's Ross Perot and uh, Ted, Teddy Roosevelt. And like that, that's it. And that's not to say there aren't others that have sort of, you know, gummed up the works in the last 120 years. But um, you know, I don't see sort of, uh, you know, whether it's a wing of the Republican Party or something like that, sort of branching off to create a third party in terms of creating that kind of a conflict. The legitimacy point, though, is an interesting one. You know, Bill Clinton gets 43 percent of the vote in 1992. And while there's sort of, you know, I think a lot of angry Republicans who sort of point to that as sort of a, an illegitimate outcome. You, you don't see the same kind of cry. And maybe 1992 is ancient history, right? We, we can't even compare what, what 2024 looks like if somebody were to get 43% of the vote on a popular basis and eke out an electoral college victory. I don't know. But I do agree. It is a, it, it is a, a rising challenge. It's a reason why Rick's, I think, uh, important work thinking about um, you know, what we're doing in the primary system or thinking about ranked choice voting or other things to sort of coalesce around majoritarian winners without having sort of as much factionalism uh, in some of these processes is, is a really important project. Yeah, Rick, do say, you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Dean Nelson. Yeah, I would say, um, first of all, um, it is true right now that the, the fragmentation or split inside the Republican Party is more extreme than inside the Democratic Party. Now, that's partly because there's a Democratic president, so that creates a certain amount of unity within the party supporting him. Um, but, but the comment that Ned makes, so the prospect he raises, is a, is a good reason why Republicans might be interested in ranked choice voting uh, for general elections when it comes to something <laughs> like this scenario where you have two really intense factions. I don't know if they're, they're too equally intense by any means, but you know, two factions in the party. The other thing I would say is normally um, one reason third parties uh, don't keep going through the process is because they're worried, or their supporters are worried they're gonna throw the vote to the, to the wrong candidate. That you know these are all Republicans, let's say, um, but if they split the vote, a Democrat will get elected. I don't know how much that dynamic would hold here. I think that if you imagine a coalition, third party led by the the sort of Liz Cheney, whatever we call them now, um, conservatives, um, and a sort of Trump wing of the party. Um, I don't know that a Cheney wing would not be happier having a Democrat reelected in 2024 than having uh, the Trump wing of the party gain power. Um, so I don't know that they would back down, even if it was clear they were only winning 25 or 30% of the vote and might split the Republican party and throw the election to the Democrats. Um, and uh, I don't know that the, the, the Trump wing would back down. Um, facing that scenario, um, given given how intense these tensions are within the party. So 
you know, there's a lot of, of, of bridges to cross between now and 2024. There is going to be an internal struggle within the Republican Party. How that struggle comes out after 2022 is certainly going to shape the reality of whether this prospect, you know, is going to continue into the 2024 election or whether the, the, the split will be settled and one side will be so dominant uh, there isn't a, a major dissenting faction. Thank you. Let me ask, given what you've all articulated around the epicenter of the evolution of uh, presidential elections being located to a large extent with the states, are there certain states that within this discourse will emerge as more prominent than perhaps they have been historically? And then what does that mean for the prospect of reform, if that's the case? If it's not, you know, why not? But love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I think about the primary system. I'm here in Iowa, and, and I, I hope this system doesn't change anymore because I, I'm now contractually <laughs> obligated to support the Iowa caucuses. I mean, I mean, I think it's, you know, to, to thinking about Rick's point, I, I think about it again on the primary caucusing side. Um, you know, it, it's a really interesting time. You know, Joe Biden placed fifth in the Iowa caucuses um, and comes out as the nominee, right? Uh, in some respects, the party coalesced around him and a lot of other candidates who were maybe garnering some support sort of dropped out. So there was sort of a place for, as Rick was pointing out, whatever the calendar indicates or whether it's primaries or caucuses or whether it's you know a, a ranked choice voting or winner take all or whatever, there's still ways that sort of the establishment party, the sort of institutional party can still sort of exert its will in appropriate ways, persuade people to drop out, whatever it might be. I don't know how much that works going forward. My, my, my bet is we're not gonna see dramatic reforms in terms of the state-by-state -state approaches to the primaries. Uh, my, my, at least like, maybe people think about dramatic changes about state-by-state -state approaches in the 2024 election. Uh, and if that's the case, it's really gonna be incumbent on the will of the leadership of the parties. And again, I think because they're the out of power party right now, the Republican party, to think about what that looks like in terms of exerting all of those extra legal sorts of uh, influences upon the nominating process. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I disagree with that if there's time. Can I make a, a quick comment about that? I think the par I, I think the parties have lost a lot more control over the nomination process than than the way Derek tells the story. Um, if you look at um, first of all, let's say the Obama Clinton primaries. Um, Clinton was certainly the the candidate of the party establishment um, until Obama started doing well enough that the party began to move toward him. But if you say if the the party decided through its leadership who the nominee was going to be that that I don't think that would characterize that and I don't think John McCain uh, would have been the choice of the Republican establishment he was the maverick after all um, obviously Donald Trump doesn't fit that bill he wasn't chosen by the the party in advance of the primaries um, and the fact that Bernie Sanders in 2016 came so close I mean he didn't he came close enough to knocking off you know, the establishment figure of the Democratic Party. And he was an independent and he had no support within the political party structure. So I think things have actually changed a lot. Um, and, and I think the parties sometimes can coalesce around a candidate that they want, but I think we have lots of contrary examples now in the modern era. Thank you. Uh, are any other comments, Joshua? Yeah, so, so in thinking about your question in terms of are there going to be particular states that are going to make a difference for 2024, I just wanted to highlight the fact that we're even having this conversation in May of 2021, you know, four months into a new administration. You, you know, when I, when I became a law professor and I told my dad that I was going to focus on election law, he said, oh, so you're going to, you know, your work's going to be relevant once every four years, uh, you know, not realizing that, you know, election law is a never ending uh, uh, endeavor. And, you know, we thought we could maybe could take a break after the 2020 election. And, and yet the work is not uh, ended at all. And, you know, we've got the crazy Arizona audit going on right now. You've got laws being passed in Georgia and Texas and Florida and Iowa uh, and, and other places. Um, and, you know, so this is something that, that, that all of us on the panel think about all the time, but 
it's really entered the public consciousness as an everyday thing. And that's, I think, really changed over the past several years and something that we need to be attuned to um, is that, you know, th this is a conversation that there, there's no such thing as an off year in election law anymore. Yeah, well said, well said. Uh, Michael, I know you want to chime in. Just loop, looping back to, to Professor Pilditz's point on the role of, of political parties and they, their diminishing strength in helping to combat extremism, one of my absolute favorite cases to teach on this issue comes from his case book, which is Duke v. Massey, which I think squarely presents the question of whether party leadership has the right to say to somebody who wants to appear on their primary ballot, like, no, you're not the kind of person we want representing our party, right? That case was, can the Republican Party keep David Duke off their ballot, say, you don't reflect Republican values and the, and the 11th Circuit up, upheld that. So, and I think that that, that law, that issue really squarely presents this question of, do we want party elites to be able to have more control over who's representing that party? Is that in some sense, right, anti-democratic, not letting the right rank and file party members have, have who they want? And I think that, and like, I think that that case just perfectly encapsulates the, 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 the issues that we're talking about here and is, and presents the type, one of the types of legislative solutions in terms of empowering party leadership that would that would lead to some of Professor Pildes's goals. Thank you, Mike. Dan, last word, and then I'm going to have to wrap up in light of the time. Great. Thanks, Camille. I'll try to be quick. Well, let me take the opportunity on behalf of everyone to thank you and, and AALS for putting this on. Um, and thanks also to Jean, Dean Chermerinsky, who invited me. Um, the last point I want to make is just to note that in terms of what's happening in the states, remembering that most, state, most election law is state law, I think we're going to see an acceleration of the trend of blue states liberalizing their laws and red states constricting them. Um, it's important to bear in mind that this may not play out exactly the way that everyone thinks. As the Republican Party's base has increasingly turned towards voters with lower education levels, that is non-college educated, mostly predominantly overwhelmingly white voters, um, it's not so clear that these more restrictive laws adopted by red states are actually going to help the Republican Party at the end of the day. But the big states to watch, I think, are ones that still have Republican legislatures but are trending blue, states like Georgia being the prime example. It'll be really interesting to see how these changes in state laws ultimately affect election results, including presidential elections. Thank you, Dan. And, and thank you all so much. I so appreciate all of your comments. And I, I know I speak on behalf of the um, conveners and the attendees uh, in saying this has been a really rich and informative conversation um, with, with much food for thought. I hope there is cause for hope, if not optimism, given the incredible work that you're all doing on the Vanguard. But uh, I wanna celebrate you and appreciate your work in leading us forward through uh, what might appropriately be seen as a quagmire of sorts in, in many domains. So thank you all. Um, it is my great honor as well now to turn the virtual mic over to Dean Vince Rougeau, who will close out this wonderful conference. Thank you so much, Camille. And uh, I just wanna echo everything you just said about the last panel. Uh, it was just fascinating. And I wanna thank all the presenters uh, for leading us through such an interesting set of issues. And thank you, Camille, for moderating. And actually, I wanna thank everyone who presented today and yesterday for the just fascinating, fascinating uh, conversations uh, the challenging <laughs> discussions that you've presented to us. I've been swinging back and forth all day between hope and despair, but uh, um, I think I'm gonna end on hope. I think uh, there's so many great people working on these issues that wanna move us, up, move us forward, and I know that they will. Uh, as president of the AALS, I wanna thank our co-hosts, the LSAC and Kelly Testi, the ABA, Patricia Rifo, and all the staff at the AALS and LSAC who organized this event so, so terrifically. We really appreciate all the work and support that you've given us. Again, thank you to all the speakers and moderators on both days, uh, particularly Bob Bauer and Jack Goldsmith, whose book inspired this conference, and Representative John Sarbanes for his leadership on HR1 and for the People Act, who opened the conference, this, that, who opened, to open the conference today. 
Uh, also, a special thank you to all of you who watched some or all of the conference. We're really glad that you took the time to be with us. The AALS will be posting a recording of the panels on our website in the next week or so. So people uh, so encourage your friends, colleagues, students uh, to uh, take a look at these wonderful panels and learn from them. Uh, I hope this conference will inspire more scholars and more students uh, to write on these important issues. And with that, I wish you all a wonderful afternoon and a great weekend. Good evening. <laughs>